All right, maybe I can um, start uh, mentioning my the takeaways that I want to have here. Yeah, so, um, that you already know what the message is, in case you still want to go to the top. There's some, we have an amazing, amazing array of tools uh, at our disposal that we can use to, well, first assess the security of our applications and then secondly fix, finally fix bugs. And um, probably the most valuable tool in this toolbox is Addison Attacker. It's valuable, or it's, I think it gives the most uh, bang for the buck because it's very easy to use. And it finds amazing, or it finds bugs with an amazing precision. And these bugs, well, sooner or later they will become, most likely will become the future relevant bugs. So it'd be just so good if we, you know, preemptively ran our Addison type builds and find these bugs early. Can we, can I get an update for you? I mean, we can continue as it is, but maybe it'd be better for the enjoyment of this one. Alright, I'm sorry. Alright, I'm trying to find someone. Wait, does this work after all, or is that? It's no effect, right? Maybe we don't need it, but. What was the effect? At least you have some light. Alright. There you go. Cool stuff. Lovely. Ah, that's better. That's different. Alright. So, we have some. Uh, I wanted to start this presentation by uh, showing how easy it is to, well, have your program, you know, exploitable with simple bugs that, well, could have been found earlier. And I would have brought some examples of uh, assumingly simple bugs that do not necessarily mm, have a direct security consequence, but which over the course of time turn out to be, well, vulnerable to very, uh, dangerous attacks. Probably one of the um, more uh, sophisticated attacks or, or the attacks that got media attention was the Heartbleed thing. And the Heartbleed vulnerability, in case you don't remember, was that uh, essentially you could read out bits of the memory of the other end of the connection. And that doesn't necessarily sound too bad, right? I mean, if you could read a few bytes here and there, what's, what could possibly be the impact? Turns out that, well, if you can poke into the other machine's memory, you can as well read their secrets. And uh, that's considered to be not so good. And um, we could have found this bug much earlier before, you know, it went haywire by using uh, tools out of our toolbox. And as I've said, I want to present some of these tools. One uh, of those tools being address sanitizer. And all you have to do is use dash f sanitize equals address, and then you're good. Are you really good? No, because it turns out that uh, building applications with these flags is more fragile than it should be. And the second takeaway uh, should be that we should enable our builds to actually build with these flags, with dash f sanitize equals address, among these other flags that I will hopefully be able to present still. And um, why are we talking about this in this uh, environment? Um, we do that because we have Flatpak, and we get to build our applications through Flatpak Builder in an automated manner, which is great. And we have now the automated builds for on every change, which is also great, which uh, Carlos has presented just before. And that in allows us to have automatic debug builds with all, with all the nice features enabled. Uh, something's happening. Let's see. That looks good, eh? Woo! Hooray! Lovely. Perfect. Very good. Even that works. That's uh, incredible. Lovely. All right. So, um, and with Flatpak, we, we get all these automated builds. You know, we can... Or, well, try to build all our applications with our, well, hardening flags and then run our test suite with, with these, um, well, enhanced builds and then hopefully catch bugs early before they uh, become a problem. And, um, let me quickly talk about security because, you know, it's, uh, it tends to be a tangible 
uh, or a touchy subject. People easily get annoyed when these security people come and tell them what to do and what to not do. And um, part of why I'm here is also to um, get more, say, uh, to, to let you know that these security people are also nice people. They have similar goals as you have, or as, like, we're, we're sitting in the same boat. That's essentially the message. And we should try to avoid having uh, the discussion of whether this is a security issue or not, or whether this is a simple bug, or whether, like, who's, who's uh, at fault, uh, who's to blame. I don't think we should have these, kind of dis these kinds of discussions. I think we just uh, fix the bugs where they are and live up to the user's expectations, because after all, we want to de deliver a free, well, platform for our users, and free to be free also means that the user can be certain that their computation is not being compromised by, well, anybody else, really. When we think security, there's many things that you could possibly think of, and it's, it's, it's a wild field, and there's so many, uh, well, concrete instantiations of the term security, and we can come up with, uh, with this list uh, very easily, and there's other institutions who provide such a list and maintain that, and it's just very long, and there's no, just no chance that we ourselves, well, can and even want to uh, take care of all these things ourselves, right? I mean, we, we want to produce uh, very nicely looking applications and very well working applications to our users, and the, uh, the security should come, well, by regular usage of the tools that we have, rather than us having to do, well, specialized things in order to enable those. And um, these, uh, these are like um, categories of bugs uh, that somebody has thought is a good classification of bugs that can occur and that will eventually lead to security issues. And as I've mentioned, some of these issues, uh, you might think, are not worth the hassle. Like, you know, as I've mentioned with the Heartbleed thing, uh, just reading a few bytes of the memory, what could possibly go wrong, or, you know, writing one byte in the wrong place, uh, the classical off by one, what could possibly go wrong. Turns out that sooner or later, this will get you in trouble. So, you know, your, your simple bug that you think is not worth uh, spending much thought uh, on might very well become a problem. In this case, I've brought uh, PHP, something PHP. It used to be, or it is popular on the internet, on the web. I don't know why. I've never understood why people run PHP. But in this, uh, I mean, again, we see that uh, they have a problem with an off by one thing, which eventually leads to a remote, remote code execution, which is probably the worst thing that can happen. We have um, here also a relatively recent thing, more security related in Kerberos, I guess security, uh, secure authentication uh, library. Uh, even they, they have this problem which yields, like, or which, which renders the, the application uh, quite vulnerable. We get um, an email, Sava Exim in this case, is also quite recent, uh, I think it was last year, some, sometime last year. And uh, here we also have a, an off by one, uh, very typical thing. And um, uh, something, um, there's even the kernel affected because, you know, we can program as, as well as we, we can or, you know, we, we try to, to write as good code as we can, but still there will be issues that we uh, haven't thought of the, or there's some weird corner case that, well, we didn't think of. And um, something more relevant to us, uh, libarchive is used by many GNOME applications, uh, if only transitively. They also, you know, have to have these problems. And wouldn't it be nice if we catch those bugs early so that they do not become a problem for us or our users? Similarly, integer overflows, easily forgotten or easily not uh, regarded as being a security problem. I want to, well, tell you that it can become a problem. And, um, the, uh, let me think, uh, where this is from. I think this is from, uh, this is SSH, right? was an issue in the SSH, right? And if there were a shell, remote access on computers, they had an integer overflow and they rendered their the, the binary vulnerable and uh, well, leading to compromise of the machine. MTLM, authentication protocol, made by Windows. The uh, integer overflow rendered the whole thing uh, vulnerable, which then rendered the authentication protocol useless. It's very small, right? you can't read. But believe me that uh, these are software projects which are important for the security of, you know, potentially the whole system, and that, a, uh, that these bugs are about relatively simple integer overflows that could have been found beforehand, before this 
program has been released. In this case, it's OpenSSL before 1.10, like 1.1.0. It's relatively recent. It's from 2015. So it's not something that the graybeards, you know, it, it's not problems, it's not a problem of these graybeards who, who write old software. It's, these are modern and up-to-date software packages which still have these problems. And it's 2018, and we still haven't learned from like 30 or 35 years of programming C that these problem classes can render your program vulnerable. And, um, for, again, for us, more relevant, this is a PDF viewer, because it turns out if you parse stuff, then, well, there's a lot of state to maintain, to be maintained, and if you have to maintain state, then you may easily get something wrong. And then, one thing that affected the GNOME community is uh, this, ah, how to put that nicely? I call it the NES problem here, which, uh, does anybody remember this from like one year ago or something? Yeah, some nodding, some people are shy to raise their hands. So let me quickly recap. There was um, an angry security guy on the internet who um, figured out that if you run an, a default installation of, I think Ubuntu it was, or Fedora, I forgot the exact details. Uh, doesn't matter the browser, or was it even Epiphany? Like, uh, anyway, the, the, the default browser would download a file, right? You just, you browse the web normally and then uh, somehow you were tricked or actively downloaded a file, and the browser would automatically download that file and put it into your home directory in the downloads folder. Well, be it as it is, then the desktop, in this, in this case, uh, this GNOME desktop, uh, went off and indexed that file. Because, you know, you, we want to produce a nice user experience, so this is why we uh, index all the files in the user's home directory, so that we can show them when we search them or when we search for metadata or something. Turns out that when parsing this file, that was, well, that code parsing that file was not all too good, which uh, eventually lead, uh, yielded a, an exploitable situation, which then cost, you know, uh, which, which then cost this uh, calculator to appear. So effectively, remote code execution without the user doing much, except for browsing the web normally. This, for security people, is very bad. And uh, our reaction, while I think was still very, uh, we being the GNOME community, was still very um, down to earth. Uh, I still had the feeling that we were pinpointing, you know, who's at fault. We didn't accept, we didn't necessarily accept that it was our fault to, well, enable the situation or to have, to, we ha haven't, I, I have the feeling we haven't really acknowledged that this is also part of our problem. And um, I think we shouldn't spend so much time on discussing whose problem it is, but just fix the bugs where they are. And in this case, it's a bit tricky because there's so many moving parts involved. You could easily blame the browser for downloading silently this file to the user's home directory. You could easily blame, blame the indexing uh, bit that, uh, you know, without any notification or without any any way for the user to to intervene, uh, reads every random file on the on the in the user's home directory. You could easily blame the indexing bits for touching files that came from an unknown context, in this case, the internet. You could easily blame the actual parser for being broken and not maintained for 15 years. You could easily blame everything that holds these things together for, well, not having thought of this situation and, I don't know, sandboxing the, uh, the actual parsing library. Turns out we do that now. Like, we, being proactive and caring about the users, I think we've reacted well. And uh, uh, turns out that other desktops, other popular desktops have a very same architecture and do provide very similar user experience or try to provide very similar experience and they are not as advanced as our technology now. Like I'm thinking about KDE Baloo in, in particular. As far as I know, they still do not uh, isolate the actual indexing or the actual parsing logic from the rest of the system. So we're still, we're, we're good, I think. I think um, we're, we, had it into the, into the right direction and did the right thing. But still, uh, this, uh, this case will not happen again, right, because we fixed it now. But uh, it's easy to conceive that there will be similar issues mm, which we will be hit by, and it would, just so, it would just be nice if we could reduce the risk now as much as possible to not, to, well, get into such a situation again. All right, oh, Jesus, I'm way too much into my time budget. So what can we do against these Things. So one obvious thing 
is we could just call dwell. Okay? And this is an old Dilbert from like 96 or something. And uh, essentially it says, so this is the manager. Eh? And he says, oh, I'll pay you for every bug you fix or for every bug you found or whatever. And then, and then these programmers say, oh yeah, we're rich. Yeah, you obviously thinking that they know that they have bugs and that no matter what the manager does, there will always be bugs in their program. And that's right. I mean, programming is a hard thing. We have so many things to keep in mind and so many extra abstractions to work through that uh, the only difference between good code and bad code is the what, to, what the fuck per minute, right? So uh, uh, the review, or the, the less, the fewer what the fucks per minute the, the review has, the better is the code. But that means that there will, there will still be issues that, you know, uh, will, uh, will baffle people and will be hard to comprehend. So then people say, oh yeah, Rust will save us. It's, you know, the new thing that the savior himself presented unto us. And it's true. And I hope we, you know, we'll get to a, uh, to the situation where most of our code base will be written in Rust. And we're on our good way, right? Uh, Federico is uh, doing amazing things. And not only Federico, of course, but, uh, uh he's, uh, he's just given a talk about how we sort of, uh, can ease the transition and all. And we should, I think we should really go in, into this direction and, uh, write more code in Rust or in other safe languages. It doesn't need to be Rust, right? But it turns out that Rust is a, is probably one of the better languages for us to, write safe and secure code while still maintaining interoper interoperability with our legacy code. Because that's, I think, um, the problem that we're having. We know that we could just rewrite everything in Rust, but you know, it's not gonna happen anytime soon unless we get, I don't know, 100 times as many people as we are now and then spend uh, like a whole year doing that. So we need strategies for dealing with that. And I want to present you some options that we have. We have compile time options, uh, and there are flag, can you read that? It's very small, isn't it? Like, uh, let, let, is it okay? Okay. Flags for the compiler itself. We can use some um, static analysis tools like uh, Coverity. Then uh, once we've compiled, we can enable runtime features. We can use uh, Valgrind, for example. Uh, Valgrind is, has been around for quite a while, and people generally know how to use it. Then there's uh, address sanitizer. And uh, I think there's no excuse for not using that because it's so cheap to do and it's so good uh, what it does. And then uh, we have other sanitizers as well. In this case, uh, uh, undefined behavior sanitizer. That would catch the integer overflow that we were talking about earlier. And uh, eventually, we want to uh, sustainably prevent these situations from happening. And uh, strategies there would be uh, fuzzing, we have one uh, amazing tool in our toolbox, which is libfuzzer, and the other is uh, AFL, both uh, things contributed to by Google. Thanks, Peter. Woo -hoo. <laughs> and, um, <laughs> sure. There's also something on GitHub called OSS that was as fast. Yeah. And that offsets fuzzing by Google for open source projects. Yeah. And same thing valuable for me for hardware. In order to integrate the hardware projects, right. and it's a self service thing. You can move up your own hardware and send a pull request, yeah. and you run fuzzing ongoing. So yeah. you get an email after you commit the bug. It's just amazing. So let me just quickly recap what Beta said, also for the internet. So there's uh, OSS Fuzz, hosted by Google, self-service. You can register your project there, and you can email whenever there's you know uh, something found, and it's just an Ill invaluable tool. And there's so many bugs being found and fixed due to this effort, and it's just really great. And I do wish we can get to the point where we can use that, but there are many challenges, well, on our way towards that, and I hope that I can get to that slide still. So one, just to a quick takeaway, what we need for that, for the libfuzzer, in fact, is we need relatively simple functions. We need a function that just takes a random stream of bytes, like an array of bytes and its size. And we need executables, or programs rather, that do that. Turns out, while we have some tests in our modules, they're not necessarily well suited for running these uh, technologies. So for both cases, we need uh, relatively simple functions and programs just take input data and work on it. And it gets worse when we think of network services because reading a file or reading from standard in is one thing. People interact with the internet, right? We also read data from remote locations, not only from files, and then it's, it gets more complicated. And I wish that, well, you as module authors, that you take that into account when writing the next test. 
So please provide simple binaries that, for beginners, take a file as input and operate on it. The next step would be to provide stop a stop file which just calls a function which performs an operation and it expects an array of data of data as a, as a parameter. That would be good. And then once we have that, we can think of automatically using the fuzzing uh, stuff that Google provides. And our friends from LibreOffice, they make, and as Bedard said, also HarfPuzz and everything, they make use of uh, OSS Fuzz and it's just so great. And I hope that we can get there one day also. So these, uh, so um, let's work through these items uh, step by step. Com compile time, runtime testing. The compile time will be relatively quick because, uh, I mean, these are some flags that you can use while compiling your application. Your debug build, that said, right? So I'm, I'm imagining that while developing, you're building the application for yourself. And then you might want to find bugs early on in, during the development cycle. Another use case is to ship securely built binaries to the users which they run. And uh, I see these two use cases, and I don't think we're catering for these two use cases well enough just yet. So we have, um, when we built through Flatpak, then we have our manifest, and it describes how the application is being built, but it's probably being meant for the end user, not necessarily for developers or for testers to, you know, find bugs early on. Maybe we can, I, I have no idea what to do about that, but maybe we can uh, have a sort of development manifest or maybe development flags, like additional, additional fields in the manifest file that describe how the, pro, the development build is different from the production build, or mm, maybe we have implicit new flags that you know, builder sets when building an application. Maybe, we, I, I don't have a solution to that, but I think we have two use cases for building binaries. One is for actual users, and the other is for developers to you know, develop the program. So these are some uh, parameters that will greatly increase, greatly increase the security of your program, and I could go through them, but uh, the GCC documentation does that much better than we do, and I'm just being shown that we have five minutes left, so I, I'd rather want to advance the slides, and I don't see any complaints. Uh, we have Coverity. I won't talk much about that myself, because Philip has done that last year, and it's been excellent, and uh, it would have found the infamous go-to-fail bug from Apple, but I'm, I'm not tr trying to pinpoint or to, to point, I don't know, bad behavior out. Just trying to say that Coverity can be a very nice tool for your, well, for your build. And again, check Philip's uh, talk out uh, from last year. We can use all this, but it really only makes sense if we have uh, an automatic tool chain. Because nobody's ever going to do that manually, right? Because our main focus is not to assess the security of our application. Our main focus is to develop nice applications. And so we need some tooling around all these, well, tools that we have. And it turns out that we do have this now. We're getting very close, at least. Uh, just Carlos' talk from uh, two slots ago uh, was brilliant for that. So we can now automatically build these applications, and maybe we can have these development builds built automatically in our CI on every change. And this will also allow us to uh, um, really really precisely see where bugs got introduced and where they got fixed. So compile time, compile time tools we have, please use them. We need to work a little bit on the details as to, well, provide a nice developer experience around these. Runtime tools. So you've built your application, and um, now you want to see you know, how the application behaves uh, during runtime and whether it, ex whether, it, whether it has any bugs that could render the application exploitable. As I've said, uh, Volgrind has been around for a while. It's a good and nice tool. It catches, uh, like the memcheck tool, detects uh, several also critical bugs uh, in memory management, like when you uh, overread some buffers or when you, um, uh, yeah. So it, it's re really good. It's just a bit slow. And, um, yeah. But there's, if you have the, if you think that your application has some memory issues, memory safety issues, then you might very well look into Valgrind. The other thing, though, <coughs> sorry. The other thing is address sanitizer, and it's just so good. And there's no real excuse not to use it, because it's so cheap to do. All you need to do, or all you need to do, quote unquote, is uh, to use this compiler flag. And um, yeah, it just finds you, it, it finds your memory safety issues in no time, and it's so precise, because you can read to the exact position in your code where the memory safety issue has happened. 
And again, no excuse. Please enable that flag in your build, except, well, there's issues attached to that, of course. We cannot use that in Flatpak just right now. Wait up. Ah, how much overhead does it have? I think um, it's at 1.5. That's the last number I have in my mind. Oh, no, 1.5 times, you know, the access speed, I, I think, but don't quote me on that. But I don't think it matters much because it's, I imagine this to be used for development builds. Like when you, you know, test the application yourself, you click around your application yourself, and it turned out, I, I did that a couple of, I think one and a half years ago. And some applications that we ship or shipped back in the day were trivially, had trivial bugs. You just needed to open them. And then we had memory safety issues. And that's just so easy, you know, to prevent by just running a build with these flags. And again, the address sanitizer, it gives you uh, uh, very precise error messages. Let me, let me give you this uh, example real quick. So we have an int array, it's probably very small, eh? sorry about that. So we, uh, effectively, we have an off by one here. Like this is a very like, contrived example of, uh, of an off by one error. And uh, this is the very nice colorful uh, ASAN trace that you get. It's a full screen. It's a screen full of information. So you have everything that you need, hopefully, to fix the issue on this screen. And I'm not going to describe all, all these colors and all, but I'm happy to talk about these like later on and, I don't know, uh, uh, show you how to actually use this in your program. But the point shall be, it's so good. And um, there's no excuse to not use it. So I'm being told that time is really running, running out. It catches some heap issues also. This is the same. Uh, ISAN uh, output, but for uh, for a heap issue now, and you get to um, yeah, you, you get very precise information. It's very good. So use that. Except you know, as I've mentioned in Flatpak, it's kind of weird because the free desktop SDK ships a GCC version, but not the um, a, a suitable GCC version, but not lib ASAN or something. So you need to use another G GCC version. You could compile that yourself, but it's a bit annoying. Fortunately, we have extensions. Like we have a GCC 7 extension for the Flatpak SDK, for the free desktop SDK. That's good, but you know, it's, it's all, it would be so much nicer if it was all just streamlined and if it would just work, right? That would be so good. And we still need to, well, work on making this nice. Undefined behavior sanitizer, it's a bit of a fringe thing maybe because it's much less, it finds much less relevant issues than the, the memory safety thing with, uh, with address sanitizer, but still it catches the integer overflows that get you in trouble sooner or later. And um, why is this an issue? Well, uh, all right, let me first show you how that looks. Uh, you run your program, it's a trivial integer overflow program, and it'll uh, print on standard error uh, that you have an issue in your program, and it shows you where it is and all. So it's, again, it's a very good thing to have. And why is that uh, an issue? Because you might think, well, then I just, you know, overflow the counter. I just overflow the integer there. No harm done, right? Eventually I miscalculate some sizes in my uh, widget layout or something. Turns out that um, compilers are smart. Compilers are very smart. And uh, the C standard has a very precise idea of what has to happen when, uh, oh, in which cases the compiler is free to do whatever it wants when certain cases happen. One instance is an integer overflow because assigned integer overflow is not defined by the C standard. So the, co the compiler is free to do whatever it thinks is it's good. And these days, uh, compilers uh, compete about speed. So they want to produce as fast binaries as possible. And the more code you can strip out of your binary, the faster you know the binary will, will be. And um, turns out that your checks for integer overflows, you know, when, when you have in your code, you check for an integer overflow, whether your, uh, your operation has produced an integer overflow. If you do that wrongly, which if you do that manually, you most likely will do, then the compiler is free to strip everything after that away, including your check whether there has been an overflow, which you know, renders your whole security measure useless because the compiler is free to just take it away from you. You might not notice that right away because, um, well, again, the compiler is free to do whatever it thinks is good and sometimes it leaves it in and sometimes it just depends on the order of flags and sometimes it just depends on the order of other code that you have in your, you know, what, what you compile. Uh, thing is, integer overflows can become an issue, and although you think you fixed them, you might have not, because the compiler took them away from you. So, Ubizan 
undefined, uh, undefined behavior sanitizer is also good. Now, how do you use that stuff? Like I've presented to you how that works and now you're all cheerful and say, oh yeah, we want that, right? We need to use that just right now. How do we do that, Toby? Please tell us. You do it like this. It's a bit um, ugly, uh, there's a, it's a bit of an ugly formatting. This is the, um, a uh, flat pack manifest for you know building applications. And as I've mentioned, you need to have an actual compiler that works with the uh, sanitizer stuff. In this case, uh, there is an extension that we have. Brilliant, just use that. And um, all you need to do, quote unquote, is to use these uh, flags while compiling, like f sanitize address. And if you feel like you know being fancy, then you use the ubizan also. And you probably want some debug symbols, and maybe you want to strip optimizations to better you know uh, interpret the results. And um, then you need to adjust your path, pathings a little bit in the environment, and then hopefully all is good. Turns out that most GNOME modules work. Many don't, though. That's not necessarily the problem of um, our modules, but of the dependencies, because some projects uh, have uh, very, uh, let's say, baroque build systems. And uh, in this case, you cannot just simply append to the environment with this mechanism and you use you know, an explicit mechanism, and it's, it's just annoying. And um, I hope that you know, once you are trying this out, then I hope that you find an issue in your, say, um, uh, project and its dependencies and fix them up so that we can uh, use these. Because these will be a requirement for us using the bigger and greater tools like OSS Fuzz. So um, yeah, please go ahead and like try that with your module. I've done that on modules manually and it's okay, but it's a bit annoying to do that, you know, 50 times and then realizing that I'm fixing up EXIF for the third time in a row because, you know, we have, we don't have a common module of, um, of these dependencies and all. And yeah, it's, it just gets a bit annoying over time. Again, we need tests to make proper use of that. So whenever you're writing new tests, please, Think of this, uh, this fuzzing use case that I will present in a second and um, provide binaries which just take either a simple file or uh, a function which just takes uh, like a char pointer and then operates on that. All right, so that was the runtime thing real quick. Again, the takeaway shall be use address sanitizer. It's a bit hard for the moment, but it's possible and we should work on making this more easy and more natural for us. All right, I'll skip through that real quick because I'm over time already. But uh, it's just so good that I can't leave it out. So one thing we can do is, um, like for testing the program, because you eventually you figure out, well, I don't want to click through my app manually, right? I don't want to do that by myself. Can't the machine do it? The answer is yes. We can use fuzzing, and it's essentially throwing just a random bunch of data onto your program. And then, you know, you might think, well, what can possibly go wrong if you feed me random data? Turns out it's surprisingly effective at finding bugs. Shockingly, effective actually. And there's no piece of major software out there that has, that has not had bugs uh, found by these tools that I, I'm gonna be, uh, gonna be presenting. And um, it would have saved us the trouble of this um, NES thing if we had used these technologies you know, for finding bugs. So again, I'm hoping that we can make more use of these things. But then you say, we don't parse anything, do we? We are desktop applications, what could we possibly parse? Turns out we parse a lot. Like on my desktop, the application that I'm having open now, I'm parsing emails, I'm parsing contacts, contacts, I'm parsing calendar entries, I parse web stuff, I uh, parse uh, some random chat protocols. I, there's so much things we parse on with the applications that we have, and there's so much uh, uh, tests not yet written that would assess uh, the quality of the code base uh, parsing all these things. All right, just real quick, there's some. Um, one of these fuzzer is American Fuzzy Lop. Again, Google technology, very good. It's not just throwing random data at programs, it's actually using an instrumented build and determining how far the code has been penetrated with the input. And then it uses that information to generate further inputs to go deeper into the program. Very, very clever. It would be so good if we could make use of that. And there's libfuzzer, which is similar, but all it does is uh, using a function, calling a function. So you need to provide something like that your function and you put the data in and the size and then you're good, right. And it looks like that, it has a fancy UI, so it make, it's, it's actually fun to use. And um, all you have to do, all quote unquote, is to use this compiler, like the special AFL compiler, and then uh, use this fuzzing tool. Why, what can we do to make it better? Well, 
with Flatpak, we have reproducible builds. At least that's the idea, right? We have uh, a one-shot command to build our application, and we have all the dependency chain, including the tool chain that we control, and uh, we can simply switch the compiler and the flags as we wish. Now it just needs to work. We just need to brush up our code base to make it work. What can we do to make it better? And this is the part where I hope we can continue afterwards in either the hallway track or a workshop later on. I think we need to in include all the necessary tools in the SDKs that we ship so that we have a nice developer experience around all these technologies. And um, in order to make proper use of these, um, well, these technologies, we need separate binaries for uh, simple tasks. So we need executables for, I don't know, parsing an image or something. We don't really have that. We, at least we could be better in providing these. So if you, you know, have your program and you're having one functionality, then please provide one executable for one functionality. And um, yeah, then my probably the most important point that I want to make is we should trying to be positive about these security bugs or these bugs which end up being a security issue, whether they are an acute security thing right now or not. And we should just fix the bugs where they are, where they happen, and just be done with the discussion and just, well, make the world a better place. And um, with that, I need to close because all the people want to see the next talk. I'm happy uh, to uh, have you, uh, well, have discussed with you in the audience, and I'm very happy to go to the hallway and discuss things further. Thank you very much.